feel the presence of God in this place. I'm so thankful to be here as always. Just a quick turnaround. I was just with you Sunday morning, so this is good. This is good to be before you again on a Saturday night. Blessings to you. Blessings to my beautiful family over there. Looking so wonderful. Appreciate them. Hallelujah. 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 There's so much I want to share tonight. I'm just like, okay, Holy Spirit, where are we going to go with this? I feel like an encyclopedia right now in the spirit. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But I'm charged up about God. I love Jesus. I love Yeshua so much. Uh, His grace and his glory, the richness of his love. I've been experiencing day in and day out, ups, downs, just his love has been uh, consistent. It never leaves, it's never left, it never dropped off, and I'm just so thankful for the Lord. Can we just give him a hand clap of praise? Uh, He's a good, good father. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's so much bubbling in my spirit, even now. Uh, I'm about to blow your mind. Watch this. (laughs) About to blow your mind. That song was just like, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Watch this. As body of believers, we often say things like, Lord, I give you glory. Paradigm shift. You ready? It's good to see glory. But being able to acknowledge the glory of God in your own identity, that you have glory in you to give to him. (laughs) Ah, my God. (laughs) And so you look at the parable of the talents. There was a traveler. There was a man who gave talents to people at the measure that was needed. When he returned, he expected a return on what he gave. He never asked them to give something that he didn't give to them. And so the reality is the glory that we're asking to see from him, he deposited in us to be able to give to him. And so when we look at glory as something that's a part of our identity, our expectation for glory shifts because now we're not looking at glory as beggars. We're looking at glory as friends. We're not looking at glory as something that if you don't give it again, we won't experience you. We're looking at glory as This is something that's activated in us that you're looking for a return on. Mm, Come on, y'all don't understand. Y'all got to catch this. My my expectation is different because it's not just about what God is giving me. It's me acknowledging everything that I have to give unto him. We walk into services differently because we know we're not coming with just an expectation of, God, I got to have you to give me something. You've given me so much that now I have something to give you a return from. You've given me so much that I can return something back to you. Mm. And this is important. This is important to understand glory and identity, especially in times like this. We have to understand glory and identity because how many know that there is a war? There is a fight. There is. Y'all see it. Y'all see it everywhere. There's a fight. There's a fight for morality. There's a fight for, for spirituality. And I say spirituality and holiness because now people are trying to mix all these aspects of spirituality and, and trying to mix what's unholy with what's, what is holy and try, trying to change your perception about righteousness, trying to change your perception about what love really does and how love really goes forward 
Lord and, and, and try, trying to bring levels of chastisement to the way that we love and the Lord that we serve. And it's all these things that's happening because we understand that we're in a battle. So we have a responsibility to multiply what's been given to us in this season because it's necessary for us to win this battle through prayer, through humility. The kingdom suffers violence. Kingdom people have been given keys to the kingdom of heaven. I want you to pay attention to the language in the Bible, and we're we going to get into this word. I want you to pay attention to the language because you'll understand this word even better if you understand identity and what we have to give a little bit better. When Peter had revelation of who Jesus was, he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's access. I give you keys. That means you have access. Turn the key. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Violent people take it by force. That's talking about spiritual matters. And so we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. There's powers. There's principalities. There's spiritual things going on that God has deposited something in us that shifts and changes atmospheres. Revival to reformation is in you, is in your prayers, is in your declarations. It's in you. Multiply it. Multiply it by being his pleasure. It's impossible to please God without faith. And so we trust and we believe. And so this is the thing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Trusting and believing. And so we're talking about tonight the power of posture. And so when I talk about uh, battle and I talk about the places that we are where there is a battle going on, the good thing about battles that we face, we already know we won, right? There can be giants in the land. There could be, there could be enemies. There could be Nephilim running around all crazy. All they're doing is storing up crops, building houses that we already own. It's already ours. We've already walked into places of victory. And so it's okay that battle is before us. That should never bring us to a point of discouragement. That should be saying we should be, we should be like the man of God that said, give me my mountain. I already know what's mine. I don't care what's in the land, what it looks like. I don't care what the spies report is. I believe the report of the Lord. And so believing the report of the Lord is already an expression of glory that brings shifts and changes that we need. Just believing the report. He's already spoke a thing over us. Encountering battle is a good thing because you know you won. And this is the thing about battle. The decisions you make in battle, y'all got to watch this body of Christ. The decisions that we make in battle, battle comes, test trials come, diverse temptations come. We'll get into that when we get into the scripture. It comes. But the decisions you make in battle determine your rank. <laughs> uh, the decisions you make in battle determines your rank. And so when God is allowing you to encounter things, he's proving you. He's proving you in the spirit. And as I'm, being, as I'm being submitted to God through the process of what he's allowing to come to me, what he's allowed to come to me, what he's allowed me to go through, never spoke defeat to me. It can't. It doesn't have the language to determine defeat. Not to me. Somebody need to receive that. Uh, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have the ability to determine that I'll be defeated at any point in my life. I have to submit power to that lie. And so the decisions I make in battle are going to determine my rank. And so there's three aspects I'm going to tell you about battle real fast. And we're going to see how far Holy Spirit, how we get through this. I'm going to be watching the time, Pastor Randy. Praise the Lord. And so one aspect of battle that God will bring you to, and these are different ones. This is, this is, they might not tell you that they might tell you this in, in uh, when you go into training, basic training, but maybe not. This is what the Holy Spirit told me to share with you tonight. There's three aspects of battle that I want to focus on tonight, and we're going to see where we're going. But the first aspect of this is dealing with myself. There's battle happening, 
and I have to deal with myself. I have to deal with my thoughts. I have to deal with my fears. I have to deal with my perceived limitations. I got to deal with myself when I'm in battle. And the Lord will allow you to see parts of yourself. He'll show you right where you are. Why? He'll show you where you are concerning where you're going. And he'll show you where you are based on the instructions and the direction that he's given you for where you are. He's speaking to you right now to prepare you for your future. Dealing with myself. All these battles, all these trials, all these losses, I got to deal with me in battle. And God will cause you to deal with yourself. James 1, 2 through 5 says this, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, there's things that's going to try you. It's things that's going to try your faith, try you at the level of your belief. But you understand that the things that are trying your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing I shall not want. If any of you lack wisdom, some translations say understanding, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraid of not. He's not withholding anything from you, and it shall be given him. And so when I'm going through these things that seem beyond my understanding, it don't seem like, Lord, I've been believing, I've been asking, but I, yet I'm still going through these things, yet I still feel this in my body. Yes, I still got that report from the doctor. I don't understand what's going on. If you don't have understanding, God's saying, just ask, come to me. Quit making up your own scenarios. Quit talking and rehearsing a while. Why it's not going to work out for you, why you can't do it, why you can't overcome, quit rehearsing that things. And if you lack understanding about the things that you're going through that's producing patience in you, ask. He's making it easy for us, y'all. He's making it easy for us. Ask. If you lack understanding, yeah, I, I know, yep, you're going through that. Yes, I, I allowed you to encounter. Yes, this can, Yes, this report came. If you lack understanding about this, ask. Ask. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The next aspect that I have to deal with when I'm in battle is dealing with you. <laughs> I got to deal with you. I'm in a battle now. I got to deal with you. <laughs> oh, this is the one that challenged pastors, isn't it? Pastor be going through and be like, I got a deal with you. How's my day, right, Pastor? How am I doing today? God, have mercy. <laughs> Glory to God. But then that's another thing that I have to do. I have to deal with you. I have to find myself in battle because I understand that God is calling us to these places of unity and that we're stronger together. And so now I have to endeavor to keep this unity. I have to endeavor to deal with you, see where you are, because it's more important that we don't break rank. Because if we lose it here, it's going to affect everything and so now I have to learn how to deal with you while we're in battle. While I'm in battle, I have to learn how to deal with you. And so sometimes we get into these places where I can't even understand that you may be going through. I have no sense of what you're going through because my eyes are so focused about the bullets that's flying in my direction. And so I treat you as somebody who doesn't understand battle while you're going through battle. And it creates this chasm because we lack understanding between each other. I got to learn how to deal with you when I'm in battle. Ephesians 4, 1 through 5 reads it like this. Therefore, the prison, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Uh, uh, walking worthy, and what we're talking about, walking worthy of the vocation is uh, stay in your post. 
Stay in your stance. Stand on what you know. Because if, if, if you go and run off around the corner, you just messed up our whole flank. You just messed up, right? And so, so I got to be worthy of this post. I got to be worthy of the, the uniform that I got on in the body of Christ. I got to be worthy of this by doing what the sergeant instructed me to do. I'm worthy of where my vocation of wherewith I've been called. I've been called to be in this position in the army of the Lord. And so I'm worthy of that by doing and following the instructions and the orders. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so I have, not just for myself, in dealing with you, I have a, a responsibility to keep the commandments, to fall more and more in love with God for your sake. to keep my commandments. If I keep his commandments, I'll be, in, I'll be in lockstep, and then my purpose impacts yours in a way where you can fulfill yours. Now we're removing stumbling blocks. The Bible says that stumbling blocks will come, but if I learn how to deal with you, we can avoid a lot of the mishaps that come from stumbling blocks. And so it says this, worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness, humility, and meekness, with long-suffering. Long-suffering is good. I used to always just think long-suffering was patience. Like, I just had to have patience with you. Um, but the word long-suffering is deeper than patience. It's patience in spite of. <laughs> it's patience in spite of what you did to me. So you can have patience. I've learned patience in a lot of areas, right? But it's different if you keep on stepping on my foot. Like, you just keep on stepping on my foot. Now my foot hurt, my toe, my big toe is, is throbbing because of you, and you keep on moving and keep doing it, and it keeps on happening. Now I have patience in spite of what you're doing to me. I used to toe to be nice. Y'all know y'all going through some things with some people that you need to have more patience with. They challenging you. They, they, being, uh, they being a little bit passive aggressive with some of the language that they're using against you. They talking to you crazy a little bit on the slide, thinking they're getting away with a little bit of stuff. But you got to have long suffering. You got to have patience in spite of their condition, in spite of where they're at, in spite of what they're trying to do to you. It was long-suffering that allowed Christ to say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It was long-suffering that allowed Stephen to see that stone come in and say, Father, for forgive them. Yeah, that's long-suffering. That's how powerful long-suffering is. It's not just patience. We can fake patience. You can't fake long-suffering. You can't do that. That's a fruit. You can't fake that. It produces something. And so he said, with meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Mm. A forbearance. Some of y'all had to do forbearances with your student loans. So you gotta forbear, <laughs> you gotta forbear one another in love. Thank you for laughing, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> you got to forbear one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit, not the unity of your attitude, not the unity of your will, not the unity of your own mind and your own understanding, but we're endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. That means I have to die to myself in order to present these things to you rightfully. The unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Sounds like unity. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Endeavoring to keep the unity is key. That's me learning how to deal with you while I'm in battle. Can you imagine trying to be focused and the person you in battle with, they're like, God help, right? I gotta have long suffering to deal with that, to keep encouraging, to keep on. But we show even more grace and more love to the weakest of us. 
That's how the Bible told us to do it, 1 Corinthians 11. And then it's the last one. It's the last one. This ain't the message. I know y'all got excited. This ain't the end of the message. This is just, this, this is just the last of the three, okay? This is the last of the three. You got some, a few more scriptures to read. <laughs> and so the last one is this. I have to deal with you dealing with me. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting perspective? Uh, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with me. I'm dealing with myself already. And then I'm dealing with you. And now I have the task of dealing with you, dealing with me. I got to deal with your opinions, your, your, your ideas, what you think I'm doing right or not doing right, uh, uh, all the information you want to give me that I didn't ask for. I'm still trying to deal with me myself. I'm trying to figure myself out. But you already given me all this. I got to deal with me dealing with you, what you want me to do, what you thought I should have did, what I didn't do right, what I could have did better. But I'm in battle. There's literally something trying to kill me, and I'm dealing with myself, and then I'm dealing with you, and now I'm dealing with you dealing with me. And so now I have a responsibility in endeavoring to keep unity where I have to figure out why you're dealing with me. I, I, I see the condition that you, I got to look into the condition that you're in and why it's causing you to deal with me the way that you're dealing with me. Why my presence is so offensive to you. Why you keep giving me attitude when I did nothing to you. Why when I did something to you that I didn't intend to do, you don't have the maturity to even come talk to me about it. You're talking to them, 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 and them about it and not even bringing it to me or giving me an opportunity. I'm dealing with that. What does that mean? How do they look at me? How do they they feel about me. Why don't nobody like me? I'm dealing with you trying to deal with me. This is why we have to endeavor to keep unity. There's these aspects of our condition, and, and, and by themselves, it's okay. But when something's trying to kill you, when there's an enemy trying to take every blessing that you have, trying to change your mind about who you are in Christ, all this stuff coming against you, when your children are going wayward, when all these things are happening that you're seeing, when, when information in some of these books are going into our schools, all this stuff is happening. Now I got to deal with you dealing with me. Watch this. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. I'm kind of in teaching mode, but I want to preach a little bit, but y'all calm enough in class, so I'll, I'll keep teaching a little bit, but we, we get in there. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. So that's the three aspects of battle. Hope you wrote that down. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, it's important to hear and to do. We just talked about Sunday about hearing, that principle of hearing. It's really important. But I want you to understand the power of posture because all these aspects in battle are things that try to shake your posture. Y'all ready to get there? We go, the key is posture. I know I told you the title, so I will preach actually what's in the title. I just wanted to preach with the things that try to shake your posture. So watch this. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, there's a lot of sayings of his that we've heard about how to endure in this posture and do with them. I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not. So those who hears his word and do with them are like a wise man who built his house on a rock and had all this opposition that has come against the house, but yet it still stands and it falls not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And so it's good for us tonight, on this Saturday night, going into the glory of God, calling down the fire of God. You have that authority on you calling down the fire of God, declaring healings, uh, and it's happening, declaring healings 
all that we're doing in God, it's good for us to find ourselves in a posture. How do we get that posture? We understand what we're built upon. Check your foundation tonight. Check your foundation tonight. Posture means this. It's the position in which something, someone holds their body when standing or sitting. That's posture. If you got good or bad posture. But the verb is this. Watch this. To place someone in a particular attitude or pose. To place someone. It's that old song. Say, like, he picked me up, turned me around place my feet on solid ground. Y'all like that one? Y'all don't like that song? Okay. It wasn't my favorite either, but it, it fits the message. And so he said, you pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. And so this posture I have from God, he set me there. He set me there. How did he set me in this posture where, where I kind of feel unmovable? People got opinions. Things come against my faith. Ideas come. The enemy's always trying to whisper something. But what gives me the posture? Pastor, you know what I've been through, some of it. But what gives me the posture to stand? God did. God did. God gave me the posture be, from what he allowed me to experience before the storm came, before the rain came, before the floods came, before the wind blew, God already allowed me to experience things that caused me to place my foundation on him. My God. And so this posture I have, he gave to me by what he allowed me to experience. And so that's why that scripture in James is so important. Understand that it's creating, it's giving you a foundation of patience. It's giving you an opportunity for understanding these diverse temptations that you go through. And it's giving you a posture to withstand all the things that the enemy would try to do, whether it be floods or winds. And so there's this profound understanding that we need concerning a solid rock and the stability that God has provided for our feet. The foundation of standing. The good thing about the rock, it's not, it's, it's not stationary. It doesn't prohibit you from moving. Sometimes in order to stand on God, we feel like we just got to be, hey, I'm stuck here. Uh, but he's always with you. The foundation is with you. And so when he says walk and go by faith, you still do that. We don't operate out of fear like we're stuck in one place. We understand that the rock is consistent with being and leading us to be where we need to be, okay? And so, and, and so God is the rock that places us, that gives us foundation. Grace strengthens us to stand on it. Grace strengthens us to stand on it. Grace gives us stability in all that we do and experience, but we cannot merit I got to say that again. Got to say that again. Grace gives us, it strengthens us to stand, but it gives us stability in all that we do and experience, but cannot merit. We can't merit it ourselves. It's that unmerited favor of God that gives us stability in adverse situations even those that you bring upon yourself. God's saying, if you call on to me, I can teach you right there. I can, I can help you right there. I can instruct you right there. <laughs> uh, all while establishing us, even though we don't deserve it. Unmerited favor. Anybody have to humble themselves under what you don't deserve? My God. And so grace is strengthening our posture or stance. It's the very thing that doesn't allow you to be moved. And so for weeks, the Lord has been rehearsing with me about this posture in spite of opposition. And I know that a lot of you have been facing opposition, and you've seen opposition to your faith. You've seen opposition to your message of God. You've seen the opposition. And it's the interrogations of our faith through everyday life that we're being challenged with. What do I mean by interrogations? Anybody in here ever experienced interrogation uh, tactics? Okay. Me, I have. Hi, I'm John. I've been interrogated. 
Interrogations don't care about the truth. They care about your confession. And so the enemy has been interrogating us to get a confession out of you. He wants you just to say, I'm sick. He wants you to say, I can't. And so these diverse situations will come into your life to interrogate you, to get you to confess something that's not true about you. I need a conviction. I'm mixing out on my quota. I got to get this conviction from you. And the only way I can get a conviction for you is you to agree with me. So where was you at at 3 a.m.? interrogations of our faith to present a case against us to get you so tired my God I'm about to talk to him let me preach to myself for a minute to get you so tired to get you so overwhelmed so hungry so cold you sitting in the room just wishing that that the AC would just why you got this AC blowing in here like this to fatigue your mind. To, this, this is what the enemy's doing to the body of Christ. When you're interceding for people who are falling away, understand their faith has been interrogated. They've been put in conditions that are, that are so unsatisfactory that they began to agree with what the enemy was telling them and, and allowing them to convict them for crimes that Christ said is not true. The enemy will convince you that you stole something that Christ paid for. Jesus. They don't care if you're innocent or not. That's what he's doing. He wants you to confess your defeat. He wants you to confess your failure. He wants you to confess your lack. He wants you to confess your struggle. He wants you to confess your separation. He wants you to talk about how nobody understands you and you can't make friends and nobody really accepts you and nobody's on your side. And, and everybody, every, every time they on that person's side, they don't even listen to my story. They, he wants you to confess whatever you can that will isolate you for conviction. This is what it means to be bound. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. We got some people to visit to, tonight. It's somebody who needs a visit because they agreed with a confession that Christ said wasn't true. Hmm. Our posture, our understanding, our standing on the word of God is so important in this season. It's a must. Our posture when the winds and the waves are blowing. Jesus is resting. They're saying, you know, you're in care for us. And this is the thing that's so interesting about that story that people really don't look at. When Jesus was resting, they said he laid on a pillow and there's a storm, there's winds and waves. I always think about that. Like, Lord, was it like raining on you? Like, was you, or was you like in a cabin or something like that laying on the pillow? Like, you was just letting full water just come, waves, and just you just laying there? That was always interesting to me. But nevertheless, if he was, whatever his posture was, he understood that the storm, though it wanted him to get to the other side, it had no jurisdiction. He had the authority. And so while they were saying, Lord, do you not care that we perish? And they're screaming for their lives and stuff like that. And he gets up and he says, uh, peace be still. Just like that. Peace be still. Simple. And then they want to marvel. What manner of man is this that the winds and the waves obey? But what we don't really preach about is the rebuke that came. The rebuke was ye of little faith. You let the storm interrogate you and say something about me that wasn't true. Yeah. Yeah. Ye of little faith. He talked to the storm. I, I could see him talking to the storm more kindly than he talked to. Peace be still. I rebuke you. 
ye of little faith. Uh, and so this is why we trust in the Lord with all our heart. We lean not on our own understanding. He said, if any of you seek lack understanding, ask. He wasn't talking about your own understanding. He was like, you need understanding from me concerning your storm. And so if you lack it, ask, because we, you should be trusting in the Lord with all your heart. The storm shouldn't change your language about me. Why is the storm changing your language concerning me? Part of your heart's not there. Okay. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. He'll navigate you through the storm. He'll navigate you through the situation. If you trust in the Lord, if you lean not on your understanding and acknowledge him in everything that's going on around you, some of us just need to find him right where the thing is that's trying to change our language or interrogate us to see him differently. He'll direct our path there. He'll navigate us through these storms. He'll, he'll show us the sure way. He'll, he'll bring us to exactly where we need to be if we trust him here. Our, our understanding or understandings, they speak to foundation. And, and, and we have an understanding or a foundation that's not trustworthy to lean on. Tell somebody, don't lean on it. Don't lean on it. Y'all shy? Okay. That's okay if you are. I'm not judging you. Don't lean on it. You can't lean on your own understanding when the storm is happening. You can't lean on your own understanding when adverse times come. That's exactly what happened. See, the, the disciples had this trend of doing this. I ain't going to preach too much on this. We're about to close out. Praise the Lord. But, but, the disciples had this trend of doing this because even when Jesus told them what he had to suffer, they shifted to their own understanding. Peter just told him who he was. Oh, you're the Christ. You're coming to do this. And he's like, I'm glad you got it. Here's some keys. Now this is what I have to suffer for your sake. Let it be far from you. Because he began to lean on his own understanding. He had his own perception of why Christ was coming and what Christ was talking about, even though he perceived him to be Christ, not by the ideas or the understanding that comes from man. But when he perceived him to be Christ, he, he zapped right up out of there and started to build an accusation based on his own understanding. We got to recognize these moments in our life where something comes to us, information comes to us that would try to get us to revert to what our, what our own soul says, what our own mind says, what our own emotions say, what our past experiences determine to us this must be. My God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Sometimes progress sometimes progress looks like failing. And you will never understand it or even be able to rejoice in it if you have a sandy relationship. Our joy is so based on our foundation. And if he is a rock, what caused you to see him as something different? What shifted your posture? What changed your stance on who he is? The whole time I'm talking about posture, and how we stand on the rock or our stance. Understand that stance is just as much an aspect of the mind as what your feet can do. Something can change your stance on how you perceive or see a thing mentally. And this is where we're losing battles. Be 
because from situation to situation or from altar call to altar call, something comes and shifts our stance. It changes our perception of what a rock is and how he's a rock in our life. And this is what I want to pray against tonight. Uh, we have to get to a place where it doesn't matter what you say about me, what I see, what I'm going through. I know he is keeping me. David said it like this. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. For him cometh my salvation. He's sure about that. David was going through some things, battle after battle after battle. Truly my soul waiteth on God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They want to pull him down. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Say la. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him, my God. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. In God. That's why I have glory to give to him. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Verse 25 says this. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory. Now I'm giving it to him. <laughs> I understand my position in him, and I understand who he is. He is the source of my glory. He is my foundation. He's my strength. And so now, a few verses later in Psalm 62, he says, To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And so to pray that, to pray that, I'm praying that as an ambassador of the truth of who he is to what belongs to him. I'm an ambassador of what belongs to him. If I have a talent to multiply, it's because he gave it to me. If I have a praise to give, it's because he put it in me. If I have, oh my God, if I have joy to express, it's because he's given it to me. I understand who he is. He is my rock. It means I don't lack in these qualities. I carry them wherever I go. That is my way of giving it back to him. That's my way of giving it back to him. I can give back to God by just not losing sight of who he is. Glory to God. Father God, we just thank you. We cast every burden. We cast every care. We cast every concern, everything that has tried to get us to waver, everything that has disrupted our rest, everything that has tried to make us uncomfortable, to change our mind about the story that we tell. This is the story that we tell, that you are faithful, that you are good, that you are glorious, that you are worthy of all praise, that you are worthy of all worship, that you are holy, that you are consistent, that you keep your word, Lord God, that you always and raise up a standard for us, that you've promised us victory and our victory is assured. These are the things that we declare on your name tonight, Father God. We give you glory. We give you honor because it's something that you've given us, Lord God. We give you no other spirit. You have not given us the spirit of fear. We will not try to return fear to you in a, as a response to what we're going through, Father God. Our response is power. Our response is love. Our response is out of a sound mind because you've given that to us. You did not give us fear. And so we cast down fear, fear that has changed our language. Fear that has changed the way we think. We cast it down. In your holy name, Jesus, we cast it down. 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 
we stay firm in the face of opposition. We stay firm in the face of what we've lost. And even in the face of what we lost, we declare your promises. We know double is coming our way. We know, Lord God, that you're adding the increase, Lord God, that those that keep their trust in you, Lord God, that you're renewing the strength of your people. You're renewing the strength of your people in this place tonight. You're restoring everything that discouragement robbed from us. You're restoring the effects of disappointment to your people. Yes, God. Yes, God, this is our posture. You are who you say you are. And you will do what you promised. <laughs> glory to God. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you glory. Come on up here, worship. Let's worship for a little bit if y'all can, if you're free to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We give you glory, God. You're so worthy. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, God. We change our language to the truth of who you are, God. You've never failed. You've never let us down. You've never given up on us. You've never discarded us. We break the effect of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. Every lie of the enemy is under our feet. Every lie, every lie, every lie, every lie of the enemy. Come on, just begin to stand on your feet. Just begin to stand on your feet. I do feel there is a need for repentance tonight. I do feel there is a need for repentance tonight. Your repentance tonight is going to break agreements. I don't need to do much laying of hands. There's, there's a maturity. There's a hunger in this room. And so I'm just being obedient to the Holy Spirit. There's a hunger. There's a maturity in this room. There's a maturity in this room. I'm telling you right now, with your whole heart, just begin to think. Just begin to release the places where you lost him. The more I seek you, the more I find you. It's hard to seek for things in trouble. Trouble has a way of changing your language. But yeah, we have a responsibility to keep our eyes on him. And so right where you are, just begin to release a sound of repentance. Lord, I repent for taking my eyes off of you. I repent. I, I, I lost sight of your faithfulness. <laughs> for a minute there, I, I didn't even believe that you saw me or cared about what I was going through or how hard it was or you were concerned about what I was concerned about. I lost sight. I started to speak differently. I, I murmured under my breath about my dissatisfaction. God, I repent. I release it to you. I wanted more, and I wanted it at the time that I, that I wanted it. It didn't seem fair. It didn't seem right. Did you see what they did to me? Did you hear how they're talking about me, how they're putting me down, and all I wanted to do was bless them? Did you care about where I was? I questioned you in those moments. God, I release and I repent. I repent, God. Let the storm cloud my vision. I let it distort my sight, God. But tonight I repent, Father God. I see you for who you are. I see you for who you are. Yeah, keep playing like this. This is the key. This is what I want you to understand. And this is the transition for you, body of Christ. As you're coming into this place of repentance, 
because all this is preparation for the miracles that we, God has promised us, the things that we're going to see. I want you to understand that this, that, that, like, I know you've looked at insurmountable deaths. I know you've looked at all these different sickness in the body, people you care about leaving and running away from God faster. You've been praying, expecting them to change, and it seems like they're running away from God. I know you have all these things in your vision, but this is what happened, and this is what causes a shift. If it shifts in you right now, this is what's going to happen. It shifted for Peter. It shifted for Peter because Peter was right with them in the first storm and he was complaining. Do you not care that we're going to perish? Do you not care that we're going to die right here in this storm? This boat's about to flip over and you over here sleeping. How can you not care? But the next time that they were in a boat and in a storm when Jesus went away to pray, Peter just needed confirmation that it was him. This is the shift for you. This is the time. This repentance is bringing us to the place where we walk on water. Peter changed his mind from the last storm. And he said, God, is it you? This thing that you're calling me to do? This thing that you're telling me to step into? Is it you, God? Is that you out there or is it a spirit? See, everybody wanted to say it was something else, but your own understanding will, will, will stop how you see. And your own understanding will say, no, it's a spirit. It's something that's coming to harm us on the water. It's something that's coming to us that's just as bad as this storm. And we're by ourselves and we don't know what to do and we're not equipped for these waves. But Peter learned from the last storm and he said, is, is that you? And if it's you, bid me to come. Ah. The most precious aspect of that was the answer. Come. how to rest with him but his grace is so outstanding that he's saying look instead of resting I'm going to teach you how to walk on these waves it said that Peter saw the wind this time and because he shifted he was able to even see more <laughs> my God how at night, if you look at the hour of that story, how in the night do you see wind? That's what the scripture says. Look at it. He said, it said, it said he saw the wind. And so now he has this greater perception. And then he saw his Savior. And he said, if you bid me to come, I'll come. Christ is telling you to come. The disappointments from last season have no bearing on how you're going to walk now. The failures of last season, the things that didn't come through or didn't work out for you last season have no bearing on how you're going to walk now. Now you're going to walk on the waves. You know, it's so interesting when, when Peter began to go under the water, I could only imagine we're talking about the mental warfare that goes on with us stepping out on faith. But I can only imagine that when he began to sink, that's what the expectation he had. It started to fit what his mind and his understanding told him what happened. But then he got to know him as a rescuer. He got to feel the strength one he believed it pulled him from sinking. What God is telling you to do is not going to fail. There's somebody who has vision in here. You try to put your hands to certain things. I'll come in agreement with you. I'll stay up here for a little while. I'm not going to do a formal altar call, but I'll stay up here for a little while. But you, you've got things that God is telling you to put your hands to. Your hesitation has been all concerned with sinking.
This is the last point of that story. It's so much. While Peter was sinking, his eyes were still on Christ. And he didn't just go down, but his hand was up to be grabbed. And you just raise your hands all over this building. Lifted hands is just expectation to say, God, I know. I know. I know. I stepped out on faith. I believed in you. You told me to come. You told me. You beckoned me to come. I know. I have an expectation. And so instead of clamoring, he didn't say, Lord, why are you letting me sink? I can't do it. He, he, he reached his hand up, and it was a hand available to be grabbed and rescued. His expectation was in the one who would save him. Lord God, our expectation is in you tonight. Lord God, we come corporately as a body with the expectation that you're moving on our behalf, that you're bringing us into glory, that you expect to meet us here. Our expectation is to be rescued, to be saved, to be loved, to be comforted. expectation is not in failure. It's not in sinking. It's not in defeat. It's not in failure. It's not in a repeat of what we experienced before. We choose to see the new thing that you're doing. We say yes to it. We accept the new thing that you're doing. We accept the new glory that you're pouring out. We accept, Lord God, what you're doing in this season. It doesn't look like what we know, but we're fine with that, God. We just accept what you're saying. We're, we're not only accepting what you're saying, but we're doing it. <laughs> we're going to be doers of what you're saying. All these sayings, you said heal the sick, God, we'll heal them. Lord God, you said set the captives free, we'll set them free, Lord God. We're going to be doers of your sayings. You said we can live holy, God. We'll live holy. Hallelujah. Father God, you hear your people. You hear the cries of their hearts. We come in agreement that it is yes and amen. We come in agreement that it's yes and amen. Just begin to just lift up a sound of praise real quick. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God.